there. That's what's called a red. So there's one there, there's probably two there, and then a little farther up. And each of those places is where a male is cleared an area and tried to attract the female to come up right away. They end up laying the egg, sort of right, the egg settle down into the bag and then cover them up again. And the reason they want to clear it off of all the sediment, but also of any algae that's there, is the eggs need a lot of oxygen in order to develop and grow. So the, um, the eggs that are laid right now will have some people. So they're in that gravel for all that time. There's a, this, the crowd and salmon seem to break up, there's some increased a little bit of spawning activity up there. Um, actually, it's probably more fighting activity. So that one male is kind of got that area and he just destroyed and cleared that off and it's kind of a little bit of a left there. Except the females. So they'll spawn <laughs> on top of each other. The females tend to be a little bit bigger and we'll touch them in a minute and you can see that. Differences in body shape. And these handouts, if you have those, the first picture is a male and it has that, what they call a hook jaw. And so the males have sort of a hook back, they're kind of hunting sometimes. Um, the second picture is a female, and you can see the difference this one here. And you can see yeah. the females tend to come up for um, a little bit less of, of time, but they'll sit on there on their reds until they kind of exhausted all their energy and then they die. So even though there's no reason for these fish to die, they're still genetically programmed so that after they spawn, they're going to die. Mm -hmm. um, they still think they're in like a Population Pacific. Spawning <laughs> in, you know, in the Pacific and all the genetics is, you know, has selected for individuals to spend all their energy trying to protect their offspring they're in the gravel now and just completely exhaust themselves and die rather than try to make the journey all the way back out to the ocean grow for another couple of years and come back and lay some more eggs the, the, the benefits of that were so slim that those kind of genes fell out of the population and what you were left with in the sockeye salmon group or the, yeah, the sockeye salmon group was just animals that will basically kill themselves in the spawning and protecting the eggs this is the first part of the run, so the run's been going about 10 days. Um, so, you know, there's not very many dead fish, and they don't even look too bad yet. You can kind of see that variations with the different salmon, like steelhead. Have people looked at steelhead? Or fish for steelhead? Mm -hmm. Those are steelhead and rainbow in the same species. But steelhead will come back, so they tend not to be in the upper so for them it was okay to do a rainbow life history and um, spawn once and then go back to the ocean so they don't all die. But they also get big so they have a benefit to grow. So the way they think the evolution worked was originally that they were trout that were freshwater. A few started going to the ocean, got bigger, and that was a, a large benefit for those groups and then they became a kind of salmon. Some of them stayed as freshwater species, like cutthroats, um, rainbows. And then what they think happened is that the steelhead are a more recent evolutionary stage of rainbows. So you have almost all the combinations of completely sea run, where these guys are so hardwired into a sea run strategy that even if you take away the access to the ocean, they still evolutionarily are working like there is an ocean out there that they can go to. Um, to things like rainbow that are spawning um, all the time. All these fish are kind of evolved from a group of fish that were in the Pacific Northwest, so rainbows are endemic to Northern California and um, various other things. With these fish, it's not quite so apparent because the run sizes aren't super big, although 5,000 of these fish are coming up here. You could imagine that this is one of the few kinds of things where nutrients move upstream in a, in a watershed. Normally, everything moves downstream with the water, but these fish are moving it back. So the chapter of the section we read out of um, the um, diary of um, 
nitrogen in the trees and so you can take uh, leaves of the tree grind it up and measure the kind of nitrogen and that nitrogen ends up being um, enriched in N15 and it turns out that in Redfish Lake about 15% of the nitrogen comes back from the ocean it's in Redfish um, you can't really do that here because the nitrogen is the same um, which are, you know, it's basically the it's freshwater nitrogen the fish don't really pick up anymore. Mm -hmm. So we'll go grab a couple of nets and try to catch some of these. Um, do people have any questions about the, just the general life history and that sort of thing? We'll have to um, bring back some fish for Erica. <laughs> so in the back of the... Yeah, so you can see the sperm coming out. Um, is that a little plastic bag on somewhere? That Tupperware thing? Yeah. Oh, no, that the <laughs> so we have males and females in here, so that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so we can try to spawn a couple. These guys here, um, they eat those little tiny copepods, pods. And these are fish that are known for eating very really small prey. So they have a structure called a gill raker on that. Ooh. I'm not getting them on the gravel anymore. On the, um, so the gill has two functions. There's some red filaments that is where the blood interacts and gets oxygen. <sighs> you need some triple two. I do, I didn't bring any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, usually we go a little bit later and they run, they're much, much less, uh... Here, we can look at them from the other side, maybe. If you look down their throat, you can see those little fine teeth. Yeah. And so that's what they strain out zooplankton with. So they eat these little copepods that are less oh, than man. a millimeter big. <laughs> so what they do is they grab it's a like bunch a... of water in their mouth and they close their mouth and then they open the back of the gills and force the water out over those gill rakers. Then they do this little closed back flush and then swallow what they've got on the gill rakers. So most like salmon, if you looked at like a brown trout or cut or a rainbow they'd have big spaces in between because they're mostly eating insects and things that are you know 10 millimeters you know if you think about what you're fishing with. Mm -hmm. So these guys are especially no, good for um can you find that little thing there? Oh no. I'll go back and get it. Um, so <laughs> mostly they they're really good for harvesting those zooplankton resources. So a lot of these reservoirs around here don't grow many insects. The water levels fluctuate so much. Like you saw here, this is pretty high. This is super high for this time of year, the water level. Um, a couple of months ago, it was down another 30 feet or so. So it's really come up since May or whatever. 
so, and that's usually this time of year, that's what the, they would be, is, um, would be really low. What that does is it means that there's almost no aquatic um, vegetation around the edges, because the rooted plants can't ever find a good space because the water's so fluctuating. So most of the productivity is, um, is in the water that's all these small zoophytes. And so the reason that the division of wildlife resources um, planted these was to try to take advantage of that. So they were in waters that not other other trout wouldn't grow very well. There were not very many insects, but there's lots of zoophytes. So that was kind of the rationale. Okay, how can we grow some fish on something that other fish aren't eating? But they're completely exotic, right? <laughs> yeah, that red color is... So, well, and plus, you know, there are the Pacific Northwest drainages that go to the Pacific. I and mean, this drainage hasn't gone to the Pacific <laughs> in, um, what, 50,000 years or so. So that was the last time that, like, um, well, about 12,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville spilled into the snake. So I guess 12,000 years ago, they could have gotten there. But 50,000 years ago, the drainages were very different here, and there was a really good connection to the ocean. Um, the Snake River, instead of going into the Columbia, went straight west and into the Klamath River Basin, and then out into the ocean that way. So it wasn't even that far compared to now um, to do that. So what I want to do is try to, do um, you want to hold mm -hmm. that? And I'll, we'll try to get some um, eggs out of a female. That's a male. That's a male. Okay. Maybe we have two females and one male. Let's see what we're going to do. Catch another fish. Not as far as I know. I'll be tacking up on the rate board up on campus though. <laughs> So some of them show the male drop characteristics. Looks so we'll like we have to go catch us a female. I think you have to catch a female. All right. You want to give it a try? It. Yeah. We'll, we'll, um, Same job. we'll do that again. So what we're going to try to do is, is get some eggs, fertilize them here, and then take them back to school and let them develop. Them. Yeah. If, if you have a really good hatchery system, you could develop them all the way to hatching in April. <laughs> So this is a rainbow. It's another introduced species. Um, we got wet on the I think you can sort of see the gill rakers are a little less <laughs> fine. Yeah. <laughs> kind of more. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of times you can take a like you could see how those rakers would just really collect something that was mayfly size or. Mm -hmm. That will be a dead one, though. <laughs> Actually, their fish are incredibly hardy. Not <laughs> really. <laughs> hey, guy. Does anybody want to, like, let him go and do the Born Free song? <laughs> Rachel, you want to hold a fish? Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's my dream in life. Does somebody want to let him go? Oh, here. I'll go do it. I ain't scared. Come here. Caught him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So one of the trick about fertilizing eggs is um, to not have... He's a hatchery fish. Yeah, they're kind of worn off a little. You don't want a lot of water in with the eggs. The sperm has to kind of coat the eggs. And that works better. Hey, little fella. Oh, yummy. Could you put that um, oh, fish right in there? Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's nice. There you go. That's like jello. That's a quite a bit yeah, of Yeah, so pass those around. Yeah. That's what the salmon eggs look like. Kind of like caviar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, They're big. The carotenoids are. Um, that's pretty cool. Their orange coloration is a carotenoid that's good <laughs> protection, from, <laughs> protection from UV light. And so when you have these shallow spawning species, that that's something that, that's of concern. So let me see if I can get a male here. 
Should be plenty of those in there. Oh, you can get phone. That beat don't work right there. You just squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> You're rough. And now we got little fish bangles. Oh, oh, no. Oh, I'm not so around in this bag. Okay, so then the idea is to coat the the eggs with sperm. And if you don't do it with a lot of water, there's a really good chance that the sperm will be covering the egg. And sort of a round bottom bucket works pretty well. So what I'm going to do is, um, then we're going to put some water on here and let them sit for a while. You can kind of pass it around again. You can kind of see there's a little white coating around most of them. And we should get some fertilization and next week I'll bring some. Get some embryos. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I have a few. Glad I put my phone away. That's cool. Oh, that's crazy. You can just squeeze them like that and then yeah. 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 eggs come out and it's And that's what they do in the cash root programs when they try to put these stocks in other reservoirs. So right now the state's using mostly, I think, um, strawberry. No, all yeah. strawberry. You missed straw. <laughs> yeah. Strawberry Jello cooking shot. and like putting them in other, yeah. other reservoirs. And, uh, but yeah, so it's kind of well, a nice thing. Cool. So did you get a good picture big. of this? Yeah, this would be really cool. <coughs> so you have to take a picture of the fertilized eggs. Oh, we got it. Okay. <laughs> so Rachel is an English major, an English graduate student, and we're trying to like enlarge her life experience. Culture. Oh yeah, it's, it's going well. <laughs> So all we really want is to not have them run out of oxygen while I get them back, and then I'll put a little air stone in them. Um, at least we get a sense. Usually the eggs from the first part of the run tend to be better than if we come later, so that's the good part. So um, how many of those would you expect to fertilize? You know, yeah, pro like 95% would get fertilized, but a lot of them wouldn't develop very well. So usually what happens is they have some stages that they do some checks. Mm -hmm. So you might get 95% fertilized <laughs> eggs, and then, especially if you get it in the hatchery. The hatchery would have a system where water would come in and bubble these up. Mm -hmm. So it would be sort of like this, these areas here. The fish like to spawn... Um, and gravels because there's a lot of water that goes through the gravel and so that's like the perfect situation to have new water running into them. Mm -hmm. If you've got a lot of fine sediments, that means there's not much flow. It's not a good place to put your eggs. So the fish are choosing locations that are going to have that, that um, good kind of flow. So um, why don't people either take a look at those or um, and then release them. I'm going to go get my camera that will do some underwater stuff and um, see if I can snag oh, some pictures of this fish underwater. underwater. Uh, these ones just got to be tired, you can tell. Yeah, they're going to start to die in about yeah. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> that one's weird, though. Just like splash the water a little bit and agitate it so they but this year, it's very cool. Yeah, so it's um. Yeah, I'm just feeling that. Yeah. Well, right now they're actually trying to release a lot in case next winter is quite this winter. It's supposed to be running in the background too. Yeah, these things kind of go in a couple year cycles. It's interesting, our climate projections for here are actually for wetter conditions. So northern East Coast is get warmer and wetter. More rain, less snow. But southern Utah is supposed to get hotter and drier. And, uh, so it's hard to imagine southern Utah getting drier. So yeah, Cedar City South is like a good break. <laughs> uh, it's gonna get bad in the climate. <laughs> <laughs> I have a professor friend who's a climatologist, and he's buying land in the Okanagan Valley to start growing grapes for wineries. He thinks in 50 years that's gonna be the best wine growing region. 
Strawberry is interesting. It's a reservoir that's more productive than porcupine. So the fish get much bigger. So if you're up towards the strawberry um, area, stop in at that place there and you can see these fish maybe three times the size. They're running right now. They're running right now, yeah. They're, and they're running, a, they'll run a little bit longer. More fish. Um, the, those systems have daphnia instead of porcupines. So the, the invertebrate, the zooplankton prey is bigger, so they're like two millimeters instead of one. <laughs> but it makes a difference. And it costs you over three years. <coughs> so those fish there all get to be 38, 40, um, 70. So not too far off some of the And the gorge also has a lot of For the end of this run, we'll start if we did the same thing, we would, just, we would fill it up with sculpins. So there's a model of sculpin species that lives in here, and they come up in the eggs. So they're moving up from downstream and up in <coughs> And then also suckers would be up there, more white fish. What kind of suckers you know? um, suckers. Mountain suckers. I'm uh, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, you saw suckers. Mountain white fish. No mountain suckers, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they have, um, also you'll see raccoons, magpies all over the place because of the dead fish in the Do they have any brown that in here? Maybe. There's not, there is, I haven't really seen that. There probably are some. Yeah. Um, but it's not like it's one of them that doesn't have as many as one of them. The browns seem to like bigger water <coughs> So if you wanted to um, try to fish for these, what would you use as a bait? I mean, you can't, you don't really have anything. Yeah, people um, fish pretty small little jigs, is what they're mostly fishing with. Yeah. Sometimes I've caught these um, on the Twin Gorge Reservoir and what they call wedding ring um, lures. I don't know if you've seen those, but they're also pretty small. And so troll down about 10 meters with those and you get them. Oh, wow. Yeah, you can't <laughs> fish them during the spine period, and they really don't eat. So they're not really biting at stuff, except in an aggressive manner, they might strike something that they think is something that's a threat. <laughs> yeah. Are but they most, like other fish that eat, will eat eggs? The coconut don't, but everybody else does. Everybody yeah, I'll let it drop here, because I just wanted a piece of it. And that yeah. rainbow is probably eating and munching it like crazy. Yeah. That's probably a good one. I mean, you can see how juicy those eggs are. <coughs> oh, yeah, those are big eggs. Yeah. And again, like that one female had about 200. I'll count them when I get home. But, you know, it's not a lot of eggs when you think about fish eggs. You know, like sturgeon have thousands of thousands of eggs. That's why we have sturgeon caviar, not open. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anything else or should we load up the vehicle? Yeah. 